Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop. We're happy to have you here. We shall begin. So today's workshop, win more business with your own managed XDR and MITRE offering. This is a workshop that, you know, we've, we've planned and we're really happy to provide. Uh, we've, you know, worked with tons of managed service providers this year, and they're all asking about managed XDR and, and really, um, you know, finding ways to offer a, a higher value service, a more profitable managed service. And that's what today's uh, workshop is about. So the workshop goals, we want to learn, or we're here to learn about Highwire Network's own MXDR journey, about operations, technology, business impact. Uh, we're also here to learn the features within D3 Smart Store that enable higher value managed services, MDR, MXDR, and, and just about you know, margin increases via automation. We're also going to show four ways to differentiate and generate revenue using MITRE's open source innovations. Uh, the first expert guest that we have here is uh, Stephen Talent. Stephen's the Chief Revenue Officer at Highwire Network. Stephen, why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself to the folks on the call? Yeah, hi, Stephen Talent, Chief Revenue Officer here at Highwire Network. Spent about 25 years or so in managed security services delivery, uh, working on uh, the vendor side of things, uh, as well as on the operational side of, uh, of the, uh, the MSSP business. So glad to be here. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And, you know, as I've noted here, Stephen is in sunny San Diego, so... Uh, Pretty jealous because myself and our next expert, our SOAR expert, uh, are stuck here in, in rainy Vancouver. So, uh, Pierre, you're our product marketing manager here at D3 Security. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, you know, implementing SOAR projects and, and uh, things like that? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and happy to be here. I've spent about a year managing the Highwire account, so from kickoff to production rollout. I was the project manager on the D3 side, so working closely with Steven's uh, implementation team. So I got to learn a lot about them and their offering and their unique position uh, as an MSSP. Uh, outside of that, I've worked with about half a dozen other MSSPs around the world, uh, both nationally and internationally. So I've got some experience understanding how automation and some of the specific features within D3 are being used right now to generate more business for MSSPs. Great. Thanks, Pierre. So, you know, today's, um, you know, title is win more business, you know, with manage XDR and with MITRE. So that's really what we want to focus on. And, you know, obviously D3 is a, a SOAR provider. Our smart SOAR platform uh, is really what is enabling these higher value services for our MSSP partners. Um, from vendor agnostic integrations, EDR interoperability, data normalization, deduplication, enrichment, triage, powerful correlations, the playbooks and workflows, the service portal, um, autonomous triage, cross-platform response. It's really those capabilities brought together in a single platform um, you know, that really enables uh, both automation to improve customer to analyst ratios and hence profit margin, but also gives you a foundation, a workbench to build MDR services or build MXDR services around. So um, we, we really like this space. We think it, it uses our platform uh, um, perfectly. Um, we have a very comprehensive uh, tool and, and helping service providers uh, do these things uh, is, is a great use of, of D3 technology. So, you know, as mentioned earlier, just a few minutes ago, um, you know, one of the partners of, of D3s is Highwire Networks. And uh, Stephen, so why don't, we, why don't you tell us a little bit about Highwire Networks, um, the Overwatch suite, Overwatch SOAR, and Overwatch MXDR? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Highwire Networks is, a, is an exclusively channel-focused master MSSP. So uh, everything that we do is supporting a partner that has a direct engagement with end customers. So we're a little different from that perspective. We don't sell direct to end customers. Um, that means that we're operationalizing cybersecurity technologies for our partners. Uh, many of them are MSPs or MSSPs that we're backing up, <clears throat> but as a, a exclusively focused at, uh, at, at the channel environment, we've been in business for 23 years. Uh, all U.S. headquartered em employees with a smattering of Canadians in there as well. A uh, 7x24 security operations center out of, uh, out of uh, the Chicago area. 
And really, we've developed our service portfolio in line with uh, our partners' goals around security uh, requirements for their end customers. And, and many of our partners are focused at SMB, mid-enterprise, some of them at the enterprise and the healthcare uh, finance, uh, different uh, areas uh, of, of the market. Um, so really, what we've done is developed a, a security service portfolio uh, that's risk-based and designed to uh, provide a layered defensive strategy um, that our partners can then go take to their customers. Uh, so really what we've done, what we noticed with XDR, you know, for years we were doing MDR. I think everybody that, that's on this call recognizes that, you know, managed detection and response around, you know, managing endpoints and the native capabilities within those endpoints to natively respond. Um, obviously a big market opportunity. And then with most businesses moving towards a, a detection and response type of fun, uh, functionality from a service delivery perspective, um, you know, this has really morphed into the requirements around XDR. Uh, the recognition that detection and response is really the way to go in reducing risk um, is readily re recognized by end customers out there. And so XDR has started to come onto the scene as um, the challenges are remain, th that remain around security is really around operationalizing security technologies. Um, you know, none of these technologies were really designed to work together. Um, you know, so you've got your Fortinets of the world, your Sentinel One, your CrowdStrikes, your Palo Altos. None of those technologies were actually designed to work together. So what XDR does is they basically bring together the, the detection response functionality uh, and incorporate all those different technologies to work in a more cohesive uh, uh, sort of fashion, working together, if you will, to secure customer environments uh, and leveraging machine learning against a large data lake uh, kind of approach to um, incorporating and ingesting security telemetry so that it can be, you know, searched and, and you know, and, and dealt with, right? Um, so for us, you know, we focused heavily uh, on the MXDR as, as probably our biggest fastest growing revenue contribution uh, to the business as most of the most of the space that you're seeing out there there's a great deal of demand probably has you know a little bit to do with Gartner and the hype cycle around MXDR but but you know really we we're, we're seeing more and more of our partners really needing to to answer uh, security requirements and MXDR really is sort of the granddaddy if you will of security services today Great. And so when you're pitching MXDR, when you're pitching a new customer, are, are you always, uh, is MXDR always a part of that? Um, do you lead with it? Is it, is it later on in the process? Like what, what are some of the, the ways that you utilize your MXDR in, in the selling process? Yeah. You know, MXDR is really the best, the best solution set for risk reduction. So most of the time, what customers are looking for is, is risk mitigation, risk reduction, uh, as well as cyber resilience, right? So you're starting to see cyber resilience being mentioned more. And that's basically the ability to deal with cyber threats, uh, be able to respond to cyber threats in a, in, in a cohesive fashion, as well as the ability to bring, uh, you know, incident response and bring services and operations back uh, in the event of, of, of a cyber attack. So really where XDR fits in is, is it's sort of, like I said, it, it sort of is the overarching uh, security service that uh, allows for, uh, our partners to go out there and really reduce risk for, in their customer environments. And as I mentioned, you know, it's, you, you've got some of the best in class technologies out there today, uh, but it, if you don't configure them properly, you're not watching them, you're not taking the response actions properly, it doesn't matter how good that technology is, uh, it, it's not going to, uh, you know, reduce risk for the, for the customer environment. So uh, XDR really is, is, is that lead in uh, component in many scenarios. It's, it's an uplift from existing MDR and the recognition of the value that that delivers uh, into extending detection and response across the, the rest of the attack surface. Right, right. And then, so, you know, I'm looking at the graphic here and, you know, given all these, you know, different services and, and, and value that you offer, um, you know, why was choosing the best SOAR platform crucial to really enable all of these things to work together. I know you have a big customer base, so you know scalability is, is obviously a concern. So just tell me about you know why SOAR was like why why did you choose uh, D three SOAR to uh, as a partner for that piece? So um, you know I, I would say that um, for those of you that are on the call that are managed security service providers looking at XDR right. You're going to be looking at different XDR platforms. You're going to wonder, hey, is is XDR SIM plus Thor together? I mean, is that XDR? Um, but as you look at the different uh, XDR platforms and security operations center platforms um, that will deliver XDR functionality, um, what you're going to find is is a real gap and limit in the true, um, you know, full blown Thor capabilities, like real valuable uh, Thor capabilities in alert triage and 
in risk reduction, in uh, reducing response times, and increasing the efficiency of your operations staff. Any of the XDR platforms out there do a pretty good job of basically bringing in that data, that data lake function, um, and 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 exercising machine learning across that data lake. Um, but the weakest thing that I think we find out there um, that with the different XDR platforms that we looked at was was the full blown response capabilities. And D3 really has allowed us to. Uh, really amplify the abilities uh, around the detection response, the enrichment of, of uh, operations, the reduction of manual uh, labor. Um, I mean, just to give you a feel, I mean, we, before D3 implementation, we were dealing with hundreds of thousands of alerts coming off of all the different technologies that were in play, the endpoints, the firewalls, cloud collaboration suites, et cetera, et cetera that were in play in the customer's environments. Just dealing with like, and we had to basically set up like risk scores. So if this is 50% or higher in risk, you know, that's when we actually would have an analyst start to look at things. And then our analysts were just deluged with, you know, that was paired, that paired 500,000 alerts down to, you know, a couple hundred thousand alerts a month. Um, so we really were struggling with uh, being efficient and effective at what our analysts were looking at, because at the end of the day, you can automate a lot of things, but at, at the end of the day, what the value that you're bringing as a security service provider is, is the analysts, you know, being able to make decisions and to, to, to reduce risk uh, by better operationalizing the securities that are out there, the security technologies that are out there. So what we were able to do with, with, uh, with D3 was really uh, uh, reduce the noise by 125 times what we were dealing with. So it's massive reduction in the amount of noise that we were dealing with because, again, you get back to analysts needing to look at things. What should they be looking at? Is it something that you can triage in an automated capacity to increase the risk score such that it then, you know, is warranted to have an analyst take a look at it? Um, you got to be able to be good at paring down the noise coming off of uh, all of the stuff that's coming in, right? Because you've just got a massive I mean, it's a big data problem, right? <laughs> Security today is a big data problem. So how do you deal with the big data? How do you reduce the false positives and get to the true positives? Uh, D3 was, was, was really you know, uh, a quintessential aspect of providing that. So we went from, uh, I would say, shoot 144,000 uh, um, uh, alerts, and then we pared that down into about 200 that wow. were really worth the attention uh, of our, our analysts. So uh, at the end of the day, it's about having your analysts be uh, you know, contributing to the business in such a way that you can grow your revenue and not be losing money when you're doing things for your customers. Um, and really, D3 was was a, was a quintessential part of of being able to actually be more effective, more responsive, uh, and and improve our SLAs around uh, response times. Great, great. That that's great detail. I appreciate that. And I know I speak for the company. We love working with you. You guys have a great team. You're always doing kind of you know, cutting edge stuff, pushing, um, you know, new playbooks and new, new automations that uh, um, are unique. And so, so we really like working with you guys and, um, you know, like a little bit more of, of, of the journey, you, you kind of touched on a few things, um, you know, there, there's sort of the, the market motion behind the scenes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and where it leads, you know, when you do launch the platform, like, how do you fine tune it? How do you, optimize the operations? Like what, what kind of staffing do you need for that program? Um, you know, and what, what does being lean and effective, you know, mean for security and for your business objectives? Yeah. So, so, you know, again, I get back to the concept for those of you that are managed security service providers that have been in the business a while, um, you know, security asset management was probably where you cut your teeth and where you where you, you know, probably a predominant sum of, of, of your revenue is associated to deployment and management of security assets, right? Um, that that environment has been more commoditized as security technologies have become a, a little bit easier to manage and use. Um, but what, what has changed is that security asset management is not seen as, as valuable as it used to be. Uh, now the real value is around detection and response um, and being able to do that across everything else, not just the endpoints. And so that really was the market motion for us was the recognition that um, the security technologies were not were not being properly operationalized. Uh, they weren't working together. Uh, detection and response was limited to the endpoints, um, and and the real the requirement from a business perspective, from a market opportunity perspective, was to take that detection and response and expand that across the attack surface. So for us, you know, we were we were that that created a challenge because in an MXDR world, right, you're normalizing and correlating security telemetry and alerts coming from all these different sources. So 
endpoints, firewalls, collaboration suites, email security, and the nature of this creates a massive amount of alert. So uh, being able to actually uh, figure out what you should be paying attention to is a real challenge. At the end of the day, what, it, what, uh, what we were leveraging the D3 platform for was uh, basically to go through a detailed event tree, uh, alert triage, um, go up and, and you know, pull uh, threat intelligence information, push up stuff to the threat intelligence uh, you know, indicators of compromise and get stuff back. Uh, have have automated decisions being made based on the the MITRE attack uh, uh, frameworks and all and so much of this stuff became automated and and it wasn't like because we were automating it we were doing we weren't doing as good of a job it, it, it translated actually to the opposite uh, we were able to really fine tune what needed to be looked at and it allowed our analysts to do a really good job around focusing on you know what they were doing we're dealing with alert fatigue we were dealing with you know, real challenges of the operators in the chair. It's a life-sucking job to sit there and look at things, just massive amounts of, of stuff coming in and trying to figure out what you should be paying attention yeah. to. Uh, and, you know, guy, you're petrified that you might miss something and have a, a customer be, you know, suffer from that. So with D3, we were able to really improve um, of the the, uh, the response times. You know, we went from, you know, uh, the, the, the average kind of response uh, we were dealing with 30 minutes to an hour uh, was the turnaround time before an analyst would be able to actually look at something that made sense to, for them to be looking at. That went down to 30 seconds uh, to wow. add, uh, of, a, of, a, of recognition and five minutes we had analysts with eyes on glass looking at the situation. So, I mean, just do the math there, right? Your people are your number one expense. And if they're spending time wasted uh, trying to figure out what they should be paying attention to as opposed to mitigating risk, then you're, you're not, you're, number one, your margins are going to suffer. Uh, and number two, you're going to lose customers because you're not doing a good job of, of reducing risk for them. So D3 really helped us with that. And there's a bunch of different things. The D3's has got a you know, great deal of capabilities around security service and security operations delivery. Great, great, great. Um, you know, a few lessons learned. I'm, I'm sure there, there are things um, that you learned in that process. You just share a few with the group and then uh, I'll pick up the pace and, and move on to Pierre here soon. Yeah, you know, the things that we learned was, you know, if you're going to get into the XDR game, then you're dealing with, like I said, a, a big data problem. Um, and all of the alerts coming off. And the, the other aspect is uh, we didn't want to get into a, a vendor lock-in kind of scenario, right? So, so the ability to have an open sort of platform that allowed us to incorporate and support, uh, you know, hundreds of different security technologies that are in play – uh, allowed us to come in and basically um, meet the customer where they were at in many of the, the technology scenarios. One of the things that you'll be challenged with is that if you look at, you know, vendor oriented or, you know, uh, or native XDR type of solutions that are really vendor focused or organizations that have bought a, a, a SOAR platform and that are now trying to have, you know, the, you're trying to basically expand wallet share for, for the rest of, yeah. of the larger business. We liked the, the D3 platform because uh, it gave us the ability to really, uh, you know, support and, and better operationalize any of the security technologies we're running into. We still have re yet to run into a technology that's out there that we haven't been able to get D3 to, to, uh, to integrate into, uh, uh, into full-blown support. And that's not just, you know, ingestion and, and, and dealing with that, but it's also the response actions that really, you know, are when the wheels hit the road from that perspective. Yeah, being vendor agnostic is is still you know super crucial to to our business. It's the reason why um, you know people select D three is the depth of integrations, the breadth. Um, if you know if we don't have an integration, we create it quickly. You know they're all vendor maintained, so that that's great feedback, and and I appreciate all the all the great stuff that you shared there, Stephen. You bet. Uh, so we're gonna switch over, uh, pivot to Pierre here, and you know, obviously EDR integrations are are, are crucial to uh, NMXDR program. So Pierre, why don't you talk a little bit about um, you know the depth and breadth of EDR integrations, um, including the ones you here see here on the screen? Sure. Yeah, I would say that any one of these integrations is enough to deliver a service around when it comes to using D3's automation. You can do a vulnerability assessments, you can do compliance checks, you can do your uh, detection, you can do your remediation. So within some of these uh, integrations, we have over 40, over 40 commands. I know Trellix, for example, is one of our largest. And like Alex said, these are entirely developed and maintained by the D3 team, informed by what our clients need, but then also updated based on how these technology partners are changing. And 
we're, we're, we go this approach. So none of our clients need to write any integration code. They don't need to stress test it, which is crucial if, you know, uh, if you're relying on your own integrations and then you push that out to production and it eventually impacts your customer's environment, this can be catastrophic. So uh, we maintain and we update and we test all of the integrations ourselves and all of our clients benefit from the work we're doing uh, you know, with our whole portfolio. Um, and so uh, another point on this is one of our priorities is to be an enabler of growth and not lock it down. And so by offering this extremely uh, wide variety of integrations and then also developing new ones as new requirements come up, we can make sure that MSSP partners, they're, they're never limited in terms of the clients that they can onboard and in terms of the use cases they can address, the, the, the requirements that they can deliver for their customers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because outside of just the integration, there's also what can you do with the integration. And so we want to make sure we're covering all of the different services that, uh, that MSSPs can deliver. Yeah, with, uh, I'll just jump in here. I mean, with the breadth of integrations, you know, that we saw on the previous screen, I'll bring it up again. And, you know, these are just EDR integrations. There's hundreds of, of others that we offer. But, you know, if you're a managed service provider, I mean, it, it's allowing you to maximize your prospect base. The, the number of um, companies that you can work with or provide a solution with, uh, connect with their tech stack, um, is is maximized and it might even allow you like uh you know there's one partner um in, in europe who i'm aware of you know allowed them to sell in more geos like you know there there were tools that are highly prevalent in, in certain geos and you know being able to integrate with those tools you know allowed them to um expand their business into these new geos um you know all these uh major partners also have you know co-sell and partner programs so um, you know, being able to integrate and connect with a broader uh, number of solutions, you know, you can also take advantage of their of their partner programs. So, um, you know, having depth and breadth of integrations is obviously crucial to uh, to delivering a, a you know a, a high value security service. Pierre, let's move on to uh, event normalization and correlation. I know this is a topic that that you in particular like to speak about, and it, it's also crucial to uh, the whole MXDR um, program. Yeah, and so event normalization and correlation, this is a, a topic that I don't think is spoken about enough in the world of automation, especially when selling to and talking about how it can help MSSPs. That's because when you look inside a SOAR platform, any automation you build is going to be, you're, you're, you're feeding it data. And how you feed it data is you point it to a specific, uh, a specific variable or, or a specific field in the event. And whatever value is in that field is what's going to be, pop, is what's going to run the playbook task. Now, if the path to that value changes, let's say because you have a different data source, then that playbook task doesn't have any data to work with and you're gonna to have to either rebuild it or build a second playbook um, or create a conditional that checks and then picks a different path. Um, and so as an MSSP, when you're potentially working with dozens of different data sources or hundreds of different data sources, even as an enterprise, um, having all of the alerts mapped and organized in the same way, right immediately on ingestion uh, means that your playbook management and the design is much, much simpler. And uh, there are different scenarios that can make this very complicated in that, let's say from one data source, it can send you multiple different formats of alerts, depending on what kind of detection rule triggered it. Then how does your SOAR platform on the spot apply the right formatting and normalization schema to those changing structures? Uh, and so these are little operational issues that if they're not tested and figured out and uh, vetted in the procurement stage can really, really limit your uh, your ability to make the most out of your SOAR platform and you'll only figure it out six months later. Uh, and so by normalizing all of the events that come in, you can see here we have, this is just an example of the, of the data sources we ingest from. The list is very, very long. Um, but making sure they're all structured and formatted in the same way inside of D3, uh, regardless of how they're sent to us, enables these more advanced, uh, these more advanced uses of SOAR, like the triage, classification, and then ultimately remediation. And then obviously you can't really correlate efficiently if the data is all structured differently. Um, and so by having it all mapped to the same schema, it enables the, you know, it makes it makes playbook management much simpler and uh, the people managing the your SOAR platform are going to have are going to be able to work more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, and you know one thing I like to add um, when speaking on this topic is in an industry where 
uh, deluges of, of, of data are present, like in an MSSP. You know, companies that MSSPs that want to be agile and flexible, they actually need to have a structure. Like if, if you're just ingesting huge volumes of alerts, um, you know, that's not making you agile. That's not making you flexible. It's really that underlying data structure um, that leads to the agility, to the flexibility, the ability to respond quickly, uh, to reclassify events if you need to. Um, so, you know, it's really that structure that 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 is crucial. And, and that's what we're delivering, um, you know, as evidenced in, in, in this slide here and in the demo that uh, Pierre will show shortly. Um, so quickly, uh, you know, we, we've also developed, uh, you know, some features that are crucial for onboarding, for um, also communicating and collaborating with clients. Uh, Pierre, spend a little bit of time on that, and then uh, we'll get to your demo uh, right away here. Sure. Yeah. So the, the, the purpose of this slide here is to speak about some of the MSSP specific features and capabilities that we deployed. And the first one is client onboarding. So especially for large MSSPs, maybe who they're operating in multiple countries, uh, onboarding all of your clients into your SOAR platform can be a very um, tiresome process. If you have hundreds of them, each one with their own API credentials, each one with their own contact list, each one with their own passwords and whatnot and data ingestion requirements and all this stuff. So those, each one of those items is an individual field you have to configure inside your store platform. So for an enterprise, it's fine. They, they just, you know, they do it once for all of their integrations, but for an MSSP, they have to do all of that for every single one of their clients. And so the actual onboarding process, again, is uh, very important to test in your procurement stage because this can, you know, shave off two to three weeks, depending on the size of your team, uh, just on the onboarding size. Uh, so Within D3, we have, a, we have a feature called the event playbook. This is kind of an automation layer that sits on top of your incident response layer. And that event playbook has many use cases. It can be used to correlate incoming alerts to existing incidents. It can be used to classify them based on threat type. And another way to do it is to uh, connect to an ITSM and get new, con new customer information and then use those details to to properly configure D3 so that a new tenant is created, their connection is up and running, playbooks are shared to that site, uh, automation rules are set up, and then and then you can go ahead and configure data ingestion. So this is something that's really valuable for large and growing MSSPs. It just takes off uh, quite a bit of workload in the initial implementation. Great, great. The second one is, oh, I just wanted to touch on the client portal yeah. real quick because this is key. I mean, um, Having a ticket system that is also integrated with the playbook engine is a huge advantage because oftentimes your workflows may require input from customers. You might need their approval. You might need to communicate back and forth with them. Uh, and so regular ticketing platforms, they, they typically, they're, they're not directly integrated with the playbook going back. There, there still has to be a human in the loop process. Okay, they've approved. Okay, they've, they've said X, Y, Z. Let's go in and figure out how to proceed with the workflow. Um, but with D3's client portal, you can keep you can keep the customer in the loop. You don't have to go somewhere else, uh, and you know anything that requires approval can be pushed to that portal. The the client can see a full list of incidents that they need to review, and so uh, by having a dedicated uh, a dedicated portal for your clients to come in, you can you can much more efficiently respond to alerts and make sure that they know all of the work that you're doing and all of the all of the actions that your team has taken and so uh, you guys uh, your clients can be confident in the service you're delivering right 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 uh, thanks pierre and uh you know another you know crucial part of of this workshop was um you know learning how to take some of miter's innovations the capabilities in the smart store platform understanding what they are and actually being able to to build a service around it or build some value whether it's just a, a monthly report or, or 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 you know something more than that there's um uh you know four or five different ways with miter data in our tool that would give a service provider a really nice brand new either point of differentiation or uh you know revenue stream um that can be activated actually quite easily so Pierre why don't we go through a couple of these and uh and then we'll jump into the demo. Sure. So initially, the, the first row there is what I call detection. So being able to track how activity uh, within your client's environment is translating to known uh, MITRE 
uh, tactics and techniques. So we have a, a feature called the attack dashboard there. And this gives clients a full bird's eye view of all of the TTPs that are currently active and trending in their uh, in their client's environment. They can drill it down, you know, which which country they're appearing in, which artifacts are associated with them. Um, they can look at individual clients or a group of them. So that's great on the detection side. On the mitigation side, you can have fully MITRE based playbooks. So I'll show you one for the credential dumping technique uh, just in the demonstration today. And of course, that'll be adaptive to whatever integrations you're using. So um, you can also build playbooks in a modular approach inside of D3, and that helps you drag and drop the correct set of tasks and the correct set of integrations into new playbooks uh, if your clients have, uh, have different environments. Uh, within D3, we'll also have suggested countermeasures. And so this can show you based on the indicators, it, it'll recommend what to do next. And we can also bring in intelligence from, of course, your EDR, your, your NDR, and your identity tools to inform this as well. And on the campaigns and group side, we can do correlation across uh, all of your clients. We can do correlation across different entities that are being, uh, that are being seen in the environment. Um, so we, we, look to, we look to break down and implement MITRE in very practical ways. Uh, inside of SmartSore. Great, great. Thanks, Pierre. So uh, let's let's jump into the demo here. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to uh, to do that. Sure. Maybe not a few minutes, more like a few seconds. But sure. Let, let me let me know when you're ready. Yeah, and, good to go. Uh, I can uh, I can start sharing my screen. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you should be able to see a queue of alerts right now. Yep, I can see it. Okay, so this is the investigation dashboard inside of SmartSore. This is the consolidated queue of all of the alerts we're ingesting. These can be from different, uh, these can be from different integration sources. And so what we're going to look at here is the monitor module at the top left. This is where we monitor uh, TTPs. Uh, you can change the cadence here to be within an hour up to up to a year. And this will show you how uh, the, the quantity of detections has changed over time. You can see all of the sub techniques within them as well. In, you can modify any of the detection parameters here within, within this monitor module. So for example, if I wanted to go in and check the credential dumping, we can come in here and see which, uh, what kind of, this is all Boolean search, so you can see and or conditions, true, false, and uh, you can create new searches here. So if there are new artifacts that you're seeing, let's say maybe IP addresses that uh, affected hosts are communicating with, you can come in here and you can add new search conditions. You can call it destination, uh, destination IP address, and then equals, and then you can set the value here. And uh, once that's in and you activate it, this will start uh, incrementing the credential dumping technique whenever that artifact is uh, is seen. And again, um, our artifacts, this happens after the normalization uh, process. So alert comes in, the data is normalized, and then we monitor all of those artifacts coming in. And uh, that's what powers this kind of the numbers you're seeing here. You can also look at TTPs across your incidents. So within SmartSore, we're unique SOAR in that we have two tiers uh, of automation. One is at the event level and the other is at the incident level. And what that does is it lets you separate out your kind of prioritization and correlation uh, automation at the event level. And you can do your enrichment and your remediation at the incident level. And so again, this is just another step we take towards helping customers reduce the number of alerts in the queue that their team are finally looking at. And so you can see how the numbers here at the incident level are much lower than at the event level. That's because many of the events that have come in have not been escalated into an incident, and that's because of the automations in place at the event level. Uh, you can also break it down by artifact. So we can see different uh, emails or devices that have been associated with TTPs here. Uh, and the severity that goes along with those, the total number of events and incidents uh, that, they're, that they're seen in. And if you want to click into any of them, we can quickly go to the specific TTP uh, and then, you know, be taken to more information about it. Or if we want to go to the specific incident that has been seen, and this is great for management, uh, if they need to be reporting to any of clients or uh, for a high level view on what their clients are being faced with. So that's on the detection side. 
Uh, all of the artifacts are mapped to the, the search logic that I showed you here and then added to the monitor dashboard. And again, at the top right, uh, you can drill down into specific client environments. You can view all of them, or you can view specific internal sites as well. So on the incident response side, I'm going to go to our configuration module. And then here in the incident playbooks, there are a few over uh, down here at the bottom for credential dumping. So I just wanted to show you how you can build in really any integration that we have into these playbooks. And so a typical style that we go with is three stage, so enrichment and then containment and recovery. This is at the incident level. And so here we're using Palo Alto, Okta, and CrowdStrike to get details on what kind of traffic is currently allowed, uh, who is the user involved in the alert, and then what is the device, uh, what is the what applications are, are are installed on it, and who should have access to this device. And then once all that information is in, you can execute any number of containment. Uh, commands. So you can uh, you can run a command directly on the device through through smart source. So you can if there's a malicious process running, you can stop it right here. If you need to isolate the endpoint, you can do that as well. You can update your allowed network traffic through Palo Alto and then take the user offline if needed to. So we really try to offer a comprehensive approach uh, to incident response. You can cover identity, email, network, endpoint, uh, and then and if if anything needs to be updated in the seam, you can do that as well. Um, but this is typically the kind of design we see in most playbooks because it's straightforward. And it we we want to automate the enrichment stage first because that's a very time consuming and MSSPs can shave off many, many hours just by consolidating information for their team to review first. And then you can move all the way to the recovery stage. You're resetting the, the affected user. You can update, reconnect the host, uh, and you can change security rules in your uh, in your network uh, detection and response tool as well. So the second playbook I want to show you here is uses a different set of tools. This is Microsoft based. So here we're using Active Directory and uh, Defender to get activity logs. So you can also so SOAR platforms don't typically ingest raw logs. We ingest alerts that have been created based off of patterns seen in those logs. So that will, those would be generated by your SIEM or your EDR. Uh, but you can always pull those logs back into D3 depending on the integration you're using and the reason why you want to pull them in. So let's say in this case, there's a suspected credential dumping attempt. You want to go in and see who initiated this, when it happened, what is the process that uh, that is current that that triggered the alert, and then what what is the machine doing? And again, in the containment stage, you can use Active Directory and Defender to you know, isolate the affected systems, and then we can reset them, update them, and bring them back online later. And one more point I want to mention, just with a a third playbook here is the modular approach that I mentioned. So this is a very similar playbook, but there are only three tasks here. And we see you know, mature SOC teams and MSSPs, they, they tend to build in this direction as well, where they'll create smaller commands called utility commands, and they'll put a, a sing or, or a sequence of workflows here, a sequence of, a sequence of actions here. They'll publish it, and then they'll just reuse them inside parent playbooks like you see here. Any task with a link to the right-hand side means there's a group of commands within it. And again, this follows the exact same structure. And this really helps because rather than rebuilding playbooks, uh, it can take a lot of time. You build a certain set of commands into a single modular uh, utility command, and then you can drag and drop them uh, into parent playbooks here, depending on, again, the specific set of integrations that each client is using. Then you can manage which site these playbooks are shared to. And so any investigators working on specific clients, they'll never run, uh, they'll never run the wrong playbook accidentally on, on an incident. And so that was my demo. I think we've got uh, 20 minutes left here, so we can move into Q&A. Uh, yeah, thank you. So Pierre, just to be clear, it's actually a, a five minute Q&A. Q it's a 45 minute session today. Um, got it. Let me just bring, bring a couple up here. Um, uh, where are they? Sorry, I had my dog barking there for a minute. So um, I'm not sure whether this one's for Stephen or for Pierre, but I think it makes sense, you know, for both. Um, 
how do you approach clients with different tools? So I'll, I'll pose that one to Stephen. Uh, yeah. So so generally, um, when we're engaged with uh, with the the, uh, the partner in an end customer engagement, we'll we'll go through a scoping uh, engagement that that includes collecting information on the different security technologies that are deployed in the different areas of their environment. So for the most part, it's, you know, what are you using on the endpoint? What are you using on the firewalls? You know, uh, are you using any email security uh, suite? What collaboration suites are you using? Are you hosting in public or private cloud environments? Um, so generally it's, it's, it's involved in the scoping or the Q, the, uh, the Q and a process of qualifying the, uh, the end customer's environment. Okay, great. And, and Pierre, what about yourself? Um, you know, how do we approach clients with different tools? Uh, I'm going to reiterate a couple of the points that I mentioned. The first is the, well, maybe three. The first is we maintain integrations and develop them ourselves. So that's number one. The second one is normalization again. So this is a very important part of any implementation is make sure that if it's a new data source, a new integration, it's going to be mapped to the proper schema that the MSSP's playbooks are, are relying on. So if there's a host name or a user, that needs to be put in a specific field. We do all of that first, so their playbooks can be just you know shared to those sites, and we can start ingesting data from them. And uh, yeah, I think the last one is that modular the the modular playbook design right. that helps a lot with scalability. Got one here for Stephen. Uh, Stephen, when you're presenting XDR, what are the use cases that you present with, if it's even use cases that you go with? Oh yeah, so uh, just to identify, yeah, we had this question the other day with uh, with a uh, an end customer in Chicago that uh, has a global sort of healthcare uh, for underprivileged kind of uh, situations, and they, you know, they, they were asking, you know, okay, SIM and XDR, like, why is that more? Why is that important when I've got, you know, Fortinet firewalls, I've got Sentinel One complete on the endpoints, and you know, basically, we indicated the use case of, you know, malicious actors leveraging DNS ports on a firewall to stand up VPN tunnels. Uh, and the fact that in, you know, in any iteration that didn't include XDR, uh, that would have been unrecognized. Um, and, you know, the ability for X, the XDR platform and the D3 capabilities to, to disallow tunnels to be set up over, you know, open internet ports. That's just one example of when the when the customer has a question about, yeah, what is XDR going to do for me that I'm not already doing on the endpoints? Um, that's kind of a use case uh, example. And the other use case examples are the fact that, you know, we've got partners out there or customers that, that have like different technologies deployed that are best in breed technologies, but they're not properly configured. They're not being properly uh, monitored and assessed. Um, those are generally use cases that we'll, that we'll drop into to identify um, that, you know, regardless of, of the quality of the technology you may have, um, the, the operationalization, I don't know if that's a word, uh, but operationalizing that technology to reduce risk is, is, uh, is, is not, uh, you know, is not a given. Got another one for Steven here. So uh, are you seeing industries or market segments in particular having interest in M MXDR? You know, what's interesting is I, I would say probably the biggest pushback on, you know, on the cost of an MXDR solution comes from the micro SMB. But I would say that 60% uh, of our install base with XDR today is a medium enterprise business. And for us, medium enterprise is, a hundred, you know, you could say 500 employees to about 100 employees is kind of a medium enterprise, right? They're the biggest consumers. Um, and I'd say another 30% of that are in the enterprise and the rest is the SMB. The SMB is getting on board because they recognize um, that, you know, 60% of them are out of business within six months of a security breach. And they've all got in, in EDR technology, right? But that's not reducing the, the trends in, in security uh, breaches and, uh, and the resulting, you know, business impact that they, uh, that they represent. But I would say the micro SMBs are the ones that push back most on the validation and the cost of an XDR solution where the mid enterprise is snapping it up. I mean, they definitely, uh, if, if y'all are looking at where to focus your energies from a market, uh, segment perspective, I'd focus on that good enterprise uh, space from that perspective. Okay, great. So we're a minute over time. There's a few more questions. Um, I think they're better handled, um, you know, uh, directly after the call. So we'll follow up with anybody whose questions weren't answered. Um, Stephen, tell us, how can uh, people get in touch with Highwire Networks if they want to? Where yeah, so, so you can contact, uh, you know, Overwatch at Highwire Networks. You can contact Stephen.Talent at Highwire Networks. 
Um, you know, for those of you that are MSSPs, we've got partners like you that we're helping uh, support your efforts. Uh, so again, we're a hundred percent channel. So you're, you're not going to see us dialing into your customers. Um, but yeah, uh, feel free to reach out. Happy to share any, uh, any uh, best practices, knowledge around what we're doing. Great. And, and for D3, you can reach us at d3security.com, sales at d3security.com for email. If you want to reach uh, Pierre, uh, his email is on the screen there. Uh, same with myself. Um, we'll be happy to chat with anybody who was on the call today. Um, now, we'll also be providing a on-demand version in uh, about one business day uh, for you to share with anybody who wasn't able to make the call today. So, Appreciate everybody's time. Stephen, really appreciate your insights and your ability to join us today. Um, Pierre, thank you as well. And uh, hope everybody has a great rest of their week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.